Part One of The Camel's Back. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. The Camel's Back by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Part One. Introduction. I suppose that of all the stories I have ever written, this one cost me the least travail, and perhaps gave me the most amusement. As to the labor involved, it was written during one day in the city of New Orleans, with the express purpose of buying a platinum and diamond wristwatch which cost six hundred dollars. I began it at seven in the morning, and finished it at two o'clock the same night. It was published in the Saturday Evening Post in 1920 and later included in the O. Henry Memorial Collection for the same year. I like it least of all the stories in this volume. My amusement was derived from the fact that the camel part of the story is literally true. In fact, I have a standing engagement with the gentleman involved to attend the next fancy dress party to which we are mutually invited, attired as the latter part of the camel. This is a sort of atonement for being his historian. End of the introduction. The Camel's Back The glazed eye of the tired reader, resting for a second on the above title, will presume it to be merely metaphorical. Stories about the cup and the lip and the bad penny and the new broom rarely have anything to do with cups or lips or pennies or brooms. This story is the exception. It has to do with a material, visible, and large-as-life camel's back. Starting from the neck, we shall work toward the tail. I want you to meet Mr. Perry Parkhurst, 28, lawyer, native of Toledo. Perry has nice teeth, a Harvard diploma, parts his hair in the middle. You have met him before, in Cleveland, Portland, St. Paul, Indianapolis, Kansas City, and so forth. Baker Brothers, New York, pause on their semi-annual trip through the West to clothe him. Montmorency and Company dispatch a young man post-haste every three months to see that he has the correct number of little punctures on his shoes. He has a domestic roadster now, will have a French roadster if he lives long enough, and doubtless a Chinese tank if it comes into fashion. He looks like the advertisement of the young man rubbing his sunset-colored chest with liniment and goes east every other year to his class reunion. I want you to meet his love. Her name is Betty Medill, and she would take well in the movies. Her father gives her three hundred a month to dress on, and she has tawny eyes and hair and feather fans of five colors. I shall also introduce her father, Cyrus Medill. Though he is to all appearances flesh and blood, he is, strange to say, commonly known in Toledo as the Aluminum Man. But when he sits in his club window with two or three iron men, and the white pine man, and the brass man, they look very much as you and I do, only more so, if you know what I mean. Now, during the Christmas holidays of 1919, there took place in Toledo, counting only the people with the italicized the, 41 dinner parties, 16 dances, 6 luncheons, male and female, 12 teas, 4 stag dinners, 2 weddings, and thirteen bridge parties. It was the cumulative effect of all this that moved Perry Parkhurst on the twenty-ninth day of December to a decision. This Medill girl would marry him, and she wouldn't marry him. She was having such a good time that she hated to take such a definite step. Meanwhile, their secret engagement had got so long that it seemed as if any day it might break off of its own weight. A little man named Warburton, who knew it all, persuaded Perry to superman her to get a marriage license and go up to the Medill house and tell her she'd have to marry him at once or call it off forever. So he presented himself, his heart, his license, and his ultimatum, and within five minutes they were in the midst of a violent quarrel, a burst of sporadic open fighting such as occurs near the end of all long wars and engagements. It brought about one of those ghastly lapses in which two people who are in love pull up sharp, look at each other coolly, and think it's all been a mistake. Afterward, they usually kiss wholesomely and assure the other person it was all their fault. Say it was all my fault. Say it was. I want to hear you say it. But while reconciliation was trembling in the air, while each was, in a measure, stalling it off, so that they might the more voluptuously and sentimentally enjoy it when it came, 
they were permanently interrupted by a twenty-minute phone call for Betty from a garrulous aunt. At the end of eighteen minutes, Perry Parkhurst, urged on by pride and suspicion and injured dignity, put on his long fur coat, picked up his light brown soft hat, and stalked out the door. "'It's all over,' he muttered brokenly as he tried to jam his car into first. "'It's all over. If I have to choke you for an hour, damn you!' This last to the car, which had been standing some time and was quite cold. He drove downtown, that is, he got into a snow rut that led him downtown. He sat slouched down very low in his seat, much too dispirited to care where he went. In front of the Clarendon Hotel he was hailed from the sidewalk by a bad man named Bailey, who had big teeth and lived at the hotel and had never been in love. Perry, said the bad man softly, when the roadster drew up beside him at the curb, I've got six quarts of the doggondest still champagne you ever tasted. A third of it's yours, Perry, if you'll come upstairs and help Martin Macy and me drink it. Bailey, said Perry tensely, I'll drink your champagne. I'll drink every drop of it. I don't care if it kills me. Shut up, you nut, said the bad man gently. They don't put wood alcohol in champagne. This is the stuff that proves the world is more than six thousand years old. It's so ancient that the cork is petrified. You'll have to pull it with a stone drill. Take me upstairs, said Perry moodily. If that cork sees my heart, it'll fall out from pure mortification. The room upstairs was full of those innocent hotel pictures of little girls eating apples and sitting in swings and talking to dogs. The other decorations were neckties and a pink man reading a pink paper devoted to ladies in pink tights. "'When you have to go into the highways and byways,' said the pink man, looking reproachfully at Bailey and Perry. "'Hello, Martin Macy,' said Perry shortly. "'Where's this Stone Age champagne?' "'What's the rush? This isn't an operation, understand. This is a party.' Perry sat down dully and looked disapprovingly at all the neckties. Bailey leisurely opened the door of a wardrobe and brought out six handsome bottles. "'Take off that darn fur coat,' said Martin Macy to Perry. "'Or maybe you'd like to have us open all the windows.' "'Give me champagne,' said Perry. "'Going to the Townsend's Circus Ball tonight?' "'Am not.' "'Vited?' "'Uh-huh.' "'Why not go?' "'Oh, I'm sick of parties,' exclaimed Perry. "'I'm sick of them. I've been to so many that I'm sick of them.' Maybe you're going to the Howard Tate's party. No, I tell you, I'm sick of them. Well, said Macy consolingly, the Tate's is just for college kids anyways. I tell you, I thought you'd be going to one of them anyways. I see by the papers you haven't missed a one this Christmas. Hm, grunted Perry morosely. He would never go to any more parties. Classical phrases played in his mind. That side of his life was closed, closed. Now when a man says, closed, closed, like that, you can be pretty sure that some woman has double-closed him, so to speak. Perry was also thinking that other classical thought about how cowardly suicide is. A noble thought, that one, warm and inspiring. Think of all the fine men we should lose if suicide were not so cowardly. An hour later was six o'clock and Perry had lost all resemblance to the young man in the liniment advertisement. He looked like a rough draft for a riotous cartoon. They were singing an impromptu song of Bailey's improvisation. One lump Perry, the parlor snake, famous through the city for the way he drinks his tea, plays with it, toys with it, makes no noise with it, balanced on a napkin on his well-trained knee. Trouble is said Perry, who had just banged his hair with Bailey's comb and was tying an orange tie round it to get the effect of Julius Caesar. "'That you fellows can't sing worth a damn. Soon's I leave the air and start singing tenor, you start singing tenor too.' "'I'm a natural tenor,' said Macy gravely. "'Voice lacks cultivation, that's all. Got a natural voice, my aunt used to say. 
naturally good singer. "'Singers, singers, all good singers,' remarked Bailey, who was at the telephone. "'No, not the cabaret. I want night egg. I mean, some doggone clerk that's got food. Food! I want—' "'Julius Caesar,' announced Perry, turning round from the mirror. "'Man of iron will and stern termination.' "'Shut up!' yelled Bailey. "'Say, it's Mr. Bailey. Send up enormous supper. Use your own judgment. Right away.' He connected the receiver and the hook with some difficulty, and then, with his lips closed and an expression of solemn intensity in his eyes, went to the lower drawer of his dresser and pulled it open. "'Look it,' he commanded. In his hands he held a truncated garment of pink gingham. "'Pants!' he exclaimed gravely. "'Look it!' This was a pink blouse, a red tie, and a buster brown collar. "'Look it!' he repeated. "'Costume for the Townsend Circus Ball. I'm a little boy carries water for the elephants.' Perry was impressed in spite of himself. "'I'm going to be Julius Caesar,' he announced after a moment of concentration. "'Thought you weren't going,' said Macy. "'Me? Sure I'm going. Never miss a party. Good for the nerves, like celery.' "'Caesar,' scoffed Bailey. "'Can't be Caesar. He is not about a circus. Caesar's Shakespeare. Go as a clown.' Perry shook his head. "'Nope.' Caesar. Caesar? Sure, chariot. Light dawned on Bailey. That's right. Good idea. Perry looked round the room searchingly. You lend me a bathrobe and this tie, he said finally. Bailey considered. No good. Sure, that's all I need. Caesar was a savage. They can't kick if I come as Caesar if he was a savage. No, said Bailey, shaking his head slowly. Get a costume over at a costumer's, over at Nolax. Closed up. Find out. After a puzzling five minutes at the phone, a small, weary voice managed to convince Perry that it was Mr. Nolak speaking, and that they would remain open until eight because of the Townsend's ball. Thus assured, Perry ate a great amount of filet mignon and drank his third of the last bottle of champagne. At eight-fifteen, the man in the tall hat, who stands in front of the Clarendon, found him trying to start his roadster. "'Froze up,' said Perry wisely. The cold froze it. The cold air. Froze, eh? Yes, cold air froze it. Can't start it? Nope. Let it stand here till summer. One of those hot old August days will thaw it out all right. Go and let it stand? Sure, let her stand. Take a hot thief to steal it. Give me taxi. The man in the tall hat summoned a taxi. Where to, mister? Go to Nolax, costume fella. Chapter 2 Mrs. Nolak was short and ineffectual looking, and on the cessation of the World War had belonged for a while to one of the new nationalities. Owing to unsettled European conditions, she had never since been quite sure what she was. The shop in which she and her husband performed their daily stint was dim and ghostly, and peopled with suits of armor and Chinese mandarins, and enormous papier-mâché birds suspended from the ceiling. In a vague background, many rows of masks glared eyelessly at the visitor, and there were glass cases full of crowns and scepters, and jewels and enormous stomachers, and paints and crepe hair and wigs of all colors. When Perry ambled into the shop, Mrs. Nolak was folding up the last troubles of a strenuous day, so she thought in a drawer full of pink silk stockings. "'Something for you?' she queried, pessimistically. "'Want costume of Julius Herr, the charioteer.' Mrs. Nolak was sorry, but every stitch of charioteer had been rented long ago. Was it for the Townsend Circus Ball? It was. "'Sorry,' she said, "'but I don't think there's anything left that's really circus.' 
this was an obstacle. Hmm, said Perry. An idea struck him suddenly. If you've got a piece of canvas, I could go as a tent. Sorry, but we haven't anything like that. A hardware store is where you'd have to go. We have some very nice Confederate soldiers. No, no soldiers. And I have a very handsome king. He shook his head. Several of the gentlemen, she continued, hopefully, are wearing stovepipe hats and swallowtail coats and going as ringmasters, but we're all out of tall hats. I can let you have some crepe hair for a mustache. Won't something stinctive? Something, let's see. Well, we have a lion's head and a goose and a camel. Camel? The idea seized Perry's imagination, gripped it fiercely. Yes, but it needs two people. Camel, that's the idea. Let me see it. The camel was produced from his resting place on a top shelf. At first glance he appeared to consist entirely of a very gaunt, cadaverous head and a sizable hump, but on being spread out he was found to possess a dark brown, unwholesome-looking body made of thick, cottony cloth. "'You see, it takes two people,' explained Mrs. Nolak, holding the camel in frank admiration. "'If you have a friend, he could be part of it. You see, there's sort of pants for two people. One pair is for the fella in front, and the other pair for the fella in back. The fella in front does the looking out through these here eyes, and the fella in back. He just got to stoop over and follow the front fella round.' "'Put it on,' commanded Perry." Obediently, Mrs. Nolak put her tabby-cat face inside the camel's head and turned it from side to side ferociously. Perry was fascinated. "'What noise does a camel make?' "'What?' asked Mrs. Nolak as her face emerged, somewhat smudgy. "'Oh, what noise? What? He sort of brays. "'Let me see it in a mirror.' Before a wide mirror, Perry tried on the head and turned from side to side appraisingly. In the dim light, the effect was distinctly pleasing. The camel's face was a study in pessimism, decorated with numerous abrasions, and it must be admitted that his coat was in that state of general negligence peculiar to camels. In fact, he needed to be cleaned and pressed. But distinctive he certainly was. He was majestic. He would have attracted attention in any gathering, if only by his melancholy cast of feature and the look of hunger lurking round his shadowy eyes. "'You see, you have to have two people,' said Mrs. Nolak again. Perry tentatively gathered up the body and legs and wrapped them about him, tying the hind legs as a girdle round his waist. The effect on the whole was bad. It was even irreverent like one of those medieval pictures of a monk changed into a beast by the ministrations of Satan. At the very best, the ensemble resembled a hump-backed cow sitting on her haunches among blankets. "'Don't look like anything at all,' objected Perry gloomily. "'No,' said Mrs. Nolak. "'You see, you got to have two people.' A solution flashed upon Perry. "'You got a date tonight?' "'Oh, I couldn't possibly.' "'Oh, come on,' said Perry encouragingly. "'Sure you can. "'Here, be good sport and climb into these hind legs.' With difficulty he located them and extended their yawning depths ingratiatingly. But Mrs. Nolak seemed loath. She backed perversely away. "'Oh, no.' "'Come on, you can be the front if you want to, or we'll flip a coin. "'Make it worth your while.' Mrs. Nolak set her lips firmly together. "'Now you just stop,' she said, with no coyness implied. "'None of the gentlemen ever acted up this way before. My husband—' "'You got a husband?' demanded Perry. "'Where is he?' "'He's home.' "'Was telephone number?' After considerable parley, he obtained the telephone number pertaining to the Nolak Penates, and got into communication with that small, weary voice he had heard once before that day. But Mr. Nolak, though taken off his guard and somewhat confused by Perry's brilliant flow of logic, stuck staunchly to his point. He refused firmly, but with dignity, to help out Mr. Parkhurst in the capacity of back part of a camel. 
Having rung off, or rather having been rung off on, Perry sat down on a three-legged stool to think it over. He named over to himself those friends on whom he might call, and then his mind paused as Betty Medill's name hazily and sorrowfully occurred to him. He had a sentimental thought. He would ask her. Their love affair was over, but she could not refuse this last request. Surely it was not much to ask, to help him keep up his end of social obligation for one short night. And if she insisted, she could be the front part of the camel, and he would go as the back. His magnanimity pleased him. His mind even turned to rosy-colored dreams of a tender reconciliation inside the camel, there, hidden away from all the world. "'Now you'd better decide right off.' The bourgeois voice of Mrs. Nolak broke in upon his mellow fancies and roused him to action. He went to the phone and called up the Medill house. Miss Betty was out, had gone out to dinner. Then, when all seemed lost, the camel's back wandered curiously into the store. He was a dilapidated individual with a cold in his head and a general trend about him of downwardness. His cap was pulled down low on his head, and his chin was pulled down low on his chest. His coat hung down to his shoes. He looked run down, down at the heels, and, Salvation Army to the contrary, down and out. He said that he was the taxicab driver that the gentleman had hired at the Clarendon Hotel. He had been instructed to wait outside, but he had waited some time, and a suspicion had grown upon him that the gentleman had gone out the back way with purpose to defraud him gentlemen sometimes did. So he had come in. He sank down onto the three-legged stool. "'Want to go to a party?' demanded Perry sternly. "'I gotta work,' answered the taxi driver lugubriously. "'I gotta keep my job.' "'It's a very good party.' "'It's a very good job.' "'Come on,' urged Perry." Be a good fella. See, it's pretty. He held the camel up, and the taxi driver looked at it cynically. Huh. Perry searched feverishly among the folds of the cloth. See, he cried enthusiastically, holding up a selection of folds. This is your part. You don't even have to talk. All you have to do is to walk and sit down occasionally. You do all the sitting down. Think of it. I'm on my feet all the time, and you can sit down some of the time. The only time I can sit down is when we're lying down, and you can sit down when, oh, any time. See? What's that thing? demanded the individual dubiously. A shroud? Not at all, said Perry indignantly. It's a camel. Huh? Then Perry mentioned a sum of money, and the conversation left the land of grunts and assumed a practical tinge. Perry and the taxi driver tried on the camel in front of the mirror. "'You can't see it,' explained Perry, peering anxiously out through the eye-holes. "'But honestly, old man, you look simply great. Honestly.' A grunt from the hump acknowledged this somewhat dubious compliment. "'Honestly, you look great.' repeated Perry enthusiastically. Move round a little. The hind legs moved forward, giving the effect of a huge cat camel hunching his back preparatory to a spring. No, move sideways. The camel's hips went neatly out of joint. A hula dancer would have writhed in envy. Good, isn't it? demanded Perry, turning to Mrs. Nolak for approval. It looks lovely, agreed Mrs. Nolak. "'We'll take it,' said Perry. The bundle was stowed under Perry's arm, and they left the shop. "'Go to the party,' he commanded, as he took his seat in the back. "'What party?' "'Fancy dress party.' "'Whereabouts is it?' This presented a new problem. Perry tried to remember, but the names of all those who had given parties during the holidays danced confusedly before his eyes. He could ask Mrs. Nolak, but on looking out the window he saw that the shop was dark. Mrs. Nolak had already faded out, a little black smudge far down the snowy street. "'Drive up town,' directed Perry, with fine confidence. "'If you see a party, stop. 
Otherwise, I'll tell you when we get there. He fell into a hazy daydream, and his thoughts wandered again to Betty. He imagined vaguely that they had had a disagreement because she refused to go to the party as the back part of the camel. He was just slipping off into a chilly doze when he was wakened by the taxi driver opening the door and shaking him by the arm. "'Here we are. Maybe.' Perry looked out sleepily. A striped awning led from the curb up to a spreading gray stone house, from which issued the low drummy whine of expensive jazz. He recognized the Howard Tate house. Sure, he said emphatically. That's it. Tate's party tonight. Sure, everybody's going. Say, said the individual anxiously, after another look at the awning. You sure these people ain't gonna romp on me for coming here? Perry drew himself up with dignity. If anybody says anything to you, you just tell them you're part of my costume. The visualization of himself as a thing rather than a person seemed to reassure the individual. All right, he said reluctantly. Perry stepped out under the shelter of the awning and began unrolling the camel. Let's go, he commanded. Several minutes later, a melancholy, hungry-looking camel, emitting clouds of smoke from his mouth and from the tip of his noble hump, might have been seen crossing the threshold of the Howard Tate residence, passing a startled footman without so much as a snort, and heading directly for the main stairs that led up to the ballroom. The beast walked with a peculiar gait which varied between an uncertain lockstep and a stampede, but can best be described by the word halting. The camel had a halting gait, and as he walked he alternately elongated and contracted like a gigantic concertina. End of Part 1